I can tell you the man that you're getting ready to hear from is excited. I just got a chance to say hi to him backstage and he is honored to be here. And we are honored to have him. Welcome to the 10th annual Road to Majority Policy Conference. This is our 10th conference. I founded Faith and Freedom Coalition 10 years ago last month to give Christians a voice in government again and to ensure that Christians who love God and believe the Bible is the word of God are the head and not the tail of our political system once again. citizens of America are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. One of Donald Trump's first actions as president was to reinstate and expand a policy it's called the Mexico USA. City policy. Every child is a precious gift from God. I am signing an executive order to defend freedom of religion. Today I am keeping another promise by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. We are united by a commitment to serve. Our Christian heritage will be cherished, protected, Defend it. A long-awaited embrace on American soil. He dropped to one knee and asked to pray for President Trump. A lower business tax rate would give the typical American households money that'll be spent. I'm going to bring back millions of jobs. This is spectacular. It's a Goldilocks report. The Iran deal is defective at its core. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The legislation I'm supporting today contains many significant reforms. Recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. This is a historic day. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. President Trump has done more than any president. Now, if the Democrats history. had accomplished half of what President Trump has, it, the liberal media would be trying to put this individual on Mount Rushmore. And folks, that's only the first two and a half years. He's not only not done yet, he's just getting started. You know, I have to tell you, it is such a tremendous honor to welcome this man back to the stage of the Road to Majority Policy Conference. He is no stranger to this organization or this event. In fact, today marks his sixth appearance He's been here twice as a private citizen, twice as a presidential candidate, and today his second appearance as president. He came to this stage three years ago, bearing a list of 21 judges, with a vacancy on the Supreme Court as the American people prepared to go to the polls. And he gave them his word. He said, if you elect me president, I will choose one of these outstanding jurists should I get the opportunity to fill that vacancy. His critics said we couldn't believe him, but today, because of his courage, his boldness, and his commitment to keeping his promises, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh sit on the U.S. Supreme Court where they belong. The truth is, We've been at this project now for 30 or 40 years. We have had some great leaders. There has never been anyone who has defended us and fought for us who we have loved more than Donald J. Trump. And he is everything he promised us he would be and more. Pro-life, pro-family, pro-freedom, pro-Israel. He is our friend. And would you please join me in welcoming to this stage the 45th President of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump.
Thank you very much. Thank you to Lee Greenwood, and thank you to Ralph for the incredible introduction and for the extraordinary leadership you've displayed for a long time. I've known Ralph for a long time. He's done an incredible job. And I didn't realize this is number six, six times. And I'll see you next year. Okay. <laughs> Ten years ago, you founded this organization with a few people and a great deal of prayer. Today, the Faith and Freedom Coalition is the largest faith-based get-out-the-vote organization in modern American history. Congratulations as well to this year's recipient of the Winston Churchill Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Bill Bennett, who's a great guy. Where is Bill? Is he here? Where is Bill? Will you come here, Bill? I want to shake you. I love this guy. I watch him all the time. I see him. He's always defending us and fighting for us, and he's fighting against the fake news. Come here, Bill. Are his boys here? He's got the best-looking family. I don't know how he did it. His wife is beautiful. Let me see. Stand up. Look at that. What a family. What a family. Bill, say a few words. Doesn't know how I did it. <laughs> With all due respect, a you're a very attractive man, but Melania has the edge. Do you mind? <laughs> You'll excuse that. He's from Queens. I'm from Brooklyn. We talk like that. This is a great president. This is a great moment. This is a great meeting. Um, our country depends on you, Mr. President, and we're grateful for everything you're doing. The only thing I'd say is you said next year. How about the year after and the year after? Thank you, Bill. Special man. Thank you very much. And he's a fighter. He's a fighter for good. We like fighters. We like fighters for good. It's wonderful to be back here with so many friends and patriots, pastors, rabbis, and a record number of students. Thank you all for the tireless work that your steadfast support and your daily prayers. Just, uh, it's incredible what it's done. And just keep them coming. Very important. Keep them coming. We're in an interesting time in our country's history. We're doing great. Just keep them coming. It's very fragile. You know, it's one vote. It's one justice. It's one, one little thing, and it can all change. You have to be very hard, very vigilant. You have to go out and vote. November 3rd is a big date next year, November 3rd. Mark it down. But I want to thank you for your voice, your time, and your energy, and to knock on doors and make calls and educate voters and mobilize your fellow Americans. Because with your help, we will soon once again win a historic victory for life, for family, for faith, and for freedom. We're saying Merry Christmas again. Do you notice? Remember? Remember? I usually save that for November, December, but I was just thinking, as I, as I mentioned, I was saying, we're going to say Merry Christmas. They're all taking it down off the department stores, everything. You'd see a big red. They'd say Happy Holidays. No Merry Christmas. They're saying Merry Christmas again. It's very interesting. They're proud of it. Since the election, we've created six million new jobs. Nobody would have believed that. We've lifted more than six million Americans off of food stamps. And we're getting Americans off welfare and back into the labor force. And they're so happy and they're making money and they love what they're doing. African-American, Hispanic-American, and Asian-American unemployment have reached the lowest rates in the history of our country. The history. The whole history. The woman's unemployment rate is now the lowest in 65 years. We're fighting for all Americans, and we're embracing the faith community. We are embracing it like it hasn't been embraced in many, many years. You know that. When I asked for your support in 2016, Americans of faith were under assault. But the shameful attempt to suppress religious believers ended the day I took 
the oath of office. We're cherishing our nation's religious heritage once again. My administration has taken historic action to protect religious liberty. We're protecting the conscience rights of doctors and nurses and teachers and groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. We're with them. Made a lot of progress. We've taken action to uphold free speech on college campuses. Colleges are now, by the way, looking around very carefully when they throw conservatives and religious folks off of their campuses. Looking around very, very carefully because they have a big, fat, beautiful monetary penalty to pay. I haven't heard too much about it since I did that a few months ago. Do you notice that? I haven't heard. I haven't heard so much about that. We give them billions and billions of dollars, and then they don't let people speak. And I don't care. Liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter. Republican, Democrat, but you can't do that. We're preserving our country's vital tradition of faith-based adoption. And we're proudly defending the sanctity of life. But keep fighting, because as most of the people in the room know, it's very fragile. Unfortunately, Democrat politicians have become increasingly hostile to pro-life Americans who want to help more children find a loving home and share their dreams with the world. Virtually every top Democrat lawmaker now supports taxpayer-funded abortion right up to the moment of birth. And by the way, if you watched Virginia, the governor, after the moment of birth. That was something that nobody, that was something that nobody heard of before. After the moment of birth. Nobody believed it. I had never heard of it. I don't think anybody had heard of it. When he talked about wrapping the child and then discussing with the mother whether or not he, she wants to keep, the child is born. So that becomes an execution. That becomes an execution. Every child, born and unborn, is made in the holy image of God. And that is why I have asked Congress to prohibit the late-term abortion of babies. We've issued a final rule to prohibit Title X taxpayer funding from subsidizing the abortion industry. All of us working to foster a culture that celebrates the sacred worth of every human life. And this could all change very quickly. Just remember, we've done things that nobody thought possible. We've done things that are so good and also so fragile. The wrong person in office, in this office right here, can change it very quickly. My administration has also taken historic action to protect Americans' rights enshrined in the Constitution. Democrats are determined to pack the courts with radical left judges who will impose their own far left views on the American people. That is why I will soon appoint my 145th judge to interpret the Constitution as written. And we have two new Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. And exactly a year ago today, in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court upheld the First Amendment rights of pregnancy care centers. And just last week, the Supreme Court ruled seven to two that the peace cross, wasn't that nice, right? There's one that would have come down. In a memorial, beautiful memorial in Maryland, which honors our heroes of World War I, but it's in the form of a cross, and they said it can stand on public land for all to see. It's so beautiful, and it takes up such an important place in that area, in that whole state. And they wanted to rip it down. They wanted to take it down because it was a cross. And uh, we won that one just two days ago in the Supreme Court. Isn't that great? <laughs> Americans' belief in God has forged the character of our country and made our nation a light unto the world. We are respected again as a nation, I will tell you that. And I'm not only talking about from a religious standpoint, our country is respected again. Today we are excited to be joined by hundreds of college students, including eight students from Liberty University, great school, who just got back from a mission trip to Oklahoma. Where are you? Stand up, please. Wow. That's fantastic. It's a great school, and Jerry Falwell's a friend of mine, and he was, he was with me right from the beginning. And he's so happy about it. I could tell you stories. He said that uh, 
He was so honored to be there. He understood from the beginning what was going along. And he does say, and so did Pastor Robert Jeffress, a great friend of mine, he'd say, our president may not be the best at the Bible. <laughs> he may not have read it 2,000 times, but he's the best for us. I want to thank the students who are here with us today from all over the country. Uh, we're really uh, incredible what you're doing, and I think people have no idea the numbers we're talking about. You know, you see all of this stuff on television, and they're noisy, they're loud, they're rude, uh, they disgrace us in so many ways, and they get publicity. But they don't realize that we have more than they do. <laughs> you know, the media likes to talk about the energy the left has. I don't think they have energy. They're trying to destroy themselves. And it's negative energy. It really is. It's like a negative energy when you see what they want to do. And I think we have more energy than we've ever had. And I said it the other day, I think the Republicans have much more energy than the Democrats. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I really believe that. Like, for instance, in the audience the other night, so many women for Trump. So many. So many. They did the same thing in 2016. Women, they'll not vote for Trump. They're not going to vote. I was saying to my wife, do you think women are going to vote for me at all? And we got a tremendous, I mean, the women came out, and it was incredible what happened against uh, Hillary Clinton, a wonderful woman, wonderful person, <laughs> who dubbed us all the deplorables. She actually said two words, you know. You know the other word. She said deplorables and irredeemables. And I thought the word irredeemable was going to catch on. Shows you what I thought. Because I think irredeemable is worse than deplorable, right? Wouldn't you say, Bill, give me a definition. Isn't it worse? But the next day I made a speech, I'll never forget, she used it, you know, I didn't think too much about it. The next day I'm in this big stadium making a speech, and I see, we're the deplorables, we love you. <laughs> I'm saying, where did that come from? <laughs> see, that's why politics is a tough business. One word can put you right out of business, right? <laughs> One word. That was not a good speech she made. I don't know who wrote it, but I don't think she'd ever want to use them again. The deplorables. The activists. <laughs> the activists in this room. And that's what you should call yourselves. You're activists. Be an activist. They, they are activists. What they do is so terrible. Be activists. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. We're expanding affordable health care, increasing access to plans, 60% cheaper than Obamacare. We're doing a plan that's going to come out if we win back the House. If we keep the Senate and win the presidency, I think we're going to do all. I think we have a great chance to do all. Uh, we have a health care plan that's far better than Obamacare. I'm keeping Obamacare alive because I felt I should have, uh, I should do that. We had a chance to terminate it, and a gentleman voted against it after campaigning for many years to repeal and replace. Then he voted against repeal and replace. Someday somebody will explain that to me. But that's what happened because we just about had it done. But we're going to actually end up better, I think. We're going to do, if we win the House back, keep the Senate and win the presidency, we're going to have a plan that blows away Obamacare. It'll be less expensive, and it'll be far better health care and health insurance. And we'll be announcing it over the next month or so. And to help patients access life-saving treatments, we passed Right to Try. I love that. You know what that is. I hope nobody in this room ever has to use it, especially you folks, you're so young. But I hope nobody has to use it, but people would travel all over the world to try and get relief. People that had money, people that didn't have money would just go home with no hope. And now we have the right to use our great geniuses, the best in the world, for uh, possible cures that haven't been approved yet. You couldn't use them. They'd go to Asia, they'd go to London, people would go to London, any place. And now we're using it, and we have had some incredible success. And I must say, the other day, I was watching uh, a favorite network of mine. And I was watching, and I heard the story of an incredible, unbelievable young woman who was battling rare bone cancer. They made a mistake. A doctor or a hospital made a mistake. She called it a, it was a medical error. Her name is Natalie Harp. And she lit up the television screen like very few people I've ever seen do it. And she talked about how they were preparing her for death. 
And because of Right to Try, she's now living and I think doing phenomenally well. And somebody said she's here. Are you here, Natalie? Is it? Where's Natalie? Will you come up here, please? Come up, Natalie. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, we all know the story about the Good Samaritan, but what you don't know is I was that forgotten person on the side of the road, the victim of medical error, the number three cause of death under the previous administration, and left to die of cancer. First, the medical establishment, they came by, and they saw me there, so they wrote prescriptions for opioids, and they walked on. Next, the political establishment, they saw me there, and they stopped just long enough to come over and tell me how to die, how to speed up my death so I could somehow die with dignity. But then an outsider, my good Samaritan, President Donald J. Trump, he saw me there and he didn't walk by. He stopped and for every single one of us, he gave up his own quality of life so we could live and work and fight with dignity because he believes in survival of the fighters, not the fittest. And so, Mr. President, I have to say you have made a lot of promises to us and you have kept every one of them. So now we're going to make you this promise. Just as you fought for us, forgotten America will never forget how you saw us on the side of the road and you walked over and you picked us up and you made us great again. And now we're going to fight for you, Mr. President. God bless you. Thank you, Natalie. I, it's just, it was an incredible thing. I saw the pictures of Natalie. She was in a wheelchair. She was in a bed. And they showed her, and it was so incredible. And they were actually preparing her for death. And uh, because of Right to Try, they had a medicine that wouldn't have been approved for years, but it was very, very, uh, it's looking good. It was looking very good. Now it's looking a lot better, Natalie, I have to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but that sucker worked, Natalie. <laughs> You know, part of the problem with Right to Try is that the big pharmaceutical companies and the labs, they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to have where a person's terminally ill or very in bad shape. They didn't want to have that on their record. I understood that. And so we didn't put it on their record. We made a second, you know, record, which uh, people don't see and we don't want to show. You know, it's unfair to them, but they didn't want it on their record because people were very far along, unfortunately. But uh, cases like Natalie have not even been that unique. We've saved many lives with what's going on. And ultimately, I guess that's probably also the best test for a medicine to see whether or not it's good. Because it really, uh, it's worked so well and we're so proud of it. They've been trying to get that approved for 45 years. They couldn't get it done. Not that easy because the medicals didn't want it, the doctors didn't want it, the country didn't want it, our country. Because they say, well, if something happens, a person's terminally ill, then they die, then we'll get sued if we do something. I said, that's okay. They'll sign an exculpatory letter. They'll sign a letter saying that we're not going to hold anybody liable. That's okay. And they said, well, that's a good idea. Can you imagine 45 years? Nobody thought of that. <laughs> Obviously, they're not in the real estate business in New York. And I just want to say that, Natalie, you are an inspiration. You, you really do. You lit up that screen. My wife watched. I, I said, you have to see this. And my wife said, that is amazing. So uh, we're very proud of you, Natalie. Thank you very much. It's so, so we want every American to have the chance to live and to dream and to thrive and to protect the safety and well-being of our citizens. We're securing our border, building the wall. It's being built right now. It could have been so easy, the wall, if they gave us the money. But they won't give us the money. The Democrats won't give us the money. And I think it's more political, because who I mean, a wall works, okay? They have drones. They want to give me unlimited money for drones, unlimited money for everything. You know, a drone flying up in the air doesn't help as 5,000 people are charging the border. <laughs> Unless you want to take nice pictures of what's happening. <laughs> so we'll have almost four, I probably believe more than 400 miles built by the end of next year. It's under construction now, and I'm taken from here. 
We're all over the place. We're taking Army Corps of Engineers is doing a great job, but we're building a lot of it. It's already started, and it's uh, a lot of it's being done, and, and uh, it's, uh, ha it has such a tremendous difference. It's day and night. This year alone, 43,000 miners have been illegally smuggled across our border, providing a lucrative cash flow to some of the most dangerous criminal organizations anywhere in the world. Loopholes in federal law prevent Homeland Security from removing illegal aliens who get smuggled into our country through bad laws. It's our bad laws. And by the way, Mexico, they're really helping us. They just put 6,000 soldiers on the southern border, their southern border, and they just announced they're going to put 16,000 soldiers on our southern border. And it's had a huge impact. It's only been a few days, literally, but it's had a huge impact, and they were great. And I'm glad I didn't have to do tariffs on Mexico. I'm glad. I'm very glad. But we've been trying to get them to do that for 40 years, more. They said for 40 years. And, and uh, you know, I, I'll tell you what, they stepped up. And as I say, Mexico is doing more to help us than the Democrats, who are doing nothing. Nothing. We have repeatedly asked the Democrats to close these loopholes and to save the lives of young immigrants. I mean, they're too busy interviewing people on the Russian witch hunt, on the hoax. If they spent a little bit less time on the Russian witch hunt, which turned out to be a total phony deal, actually, they're the ones that committed the crime, as it turned out. If they spent some time on that, they could solve the loophole problem in an hour. They could solve the asylum problem in an hour. And we'd have no problem whatsoever at the border. They don't want to do it. They want things to look bad. They want open borders. Open borders mean crime, means human trafficking. Human trafficking. Mostly women, okay? Human trafficking. This is like prehistoric, a word like that, trafficking. Who would think? There's more human trafficking in the world today than there ever has been in history. Who would think that? You think of it almost as an ancient term. It's not. Because of the internet, all over the world, it's happening, mostly women. And the Democrats don't want to fix it. My administration is also speaking out against religious persecution all around the world. We believe that every community has the right to worship in peace. In Latin America, we support the people of Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela in their righteous struggle for freedom. In America, we reject the failed socialist ideology of government domination. Above all else, we know this. In America, we don't worship government. We worship God. You came out like no movement in history. There's never been a movement like happened in 2016. Never happened before to that extent. There's never been a movement like that. And even now, we still fight and fight and fight. They just refuse to accept. But we're winning the fight, and it's a very important fight. And the election coming up is, in certain ways, maybe going to be as important. I can't say more important, but as important as the election of 2016. In certain ways, it could be more important. I mean, it really could, because it could all go down very quickly. I mean, you have to be very, very careful. Bill, I don't think there's ever been anything like happened in 2016. What do you think? I really, you know, I believe it. I, I just, not because of me, it's just a movement that nobody's ever seen anything like it anywhere. The choice of our future has never been clearer. The radical left offers a vision of socialism, censorship, high taxes, open borders, and extreme late-term abortion. Our movement is about lifting up all Americans. We're fighting for the American worker. We're fighting for the American family. And we're fighting for the American dream. With your help, our nation will prosper in the fullness of faith and the glory of liberty. Our families will be strong, our children will be free, our country will be safe, and America will forever remain one proud nation under God. Together with the love, the prayers, and devotion of everyone in this room, and the millions and millions of patriots all across our land, we will make America great again for all Americans, greater 
than ever before. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Joining me now, Ralph Reed, chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Uh, Ralph, I caught the end, and I had to go back and watch the beginning, so I was doing my podcast. But this seemed like a president to me, and I've watched pretty much every speech, who's so, again, as I said, at ease with who he is now and where he is now in his presidency, knowing he has a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. Is that, was that the way the crowd there took it? Very much so. I mean, this was his sixth appearance at Faith and Freedom's Road to Majority Policy Conference, and he's been there twice as a private citizen, twice as a presidential candidate. This was his second appearance as president, and I have to tell you, Laura, this will be my 11th presidential campaign. I've seen a lot of candidates come in. I know it's scary, but he was so at ease. He felt, um, well, it was a friendly audience, obviously. Yeah, of course. But the thing that I, you know, just... As a political actor that I was impressed by is he didn't try to be something he wasn't. He spoke for an hour and 20 minutes. He never gave a scripture verse. He talked about his heart shared their values. He didn't try to be somebody he wasn't. He talked about shared values, policies, and most importantly, Laura, he said, I will fight for you. Wonderful to be back with the men and women of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, and uh, and I'm especially uh, especially honored by the words that just preceded me. You know, Abraham Lincoln said his only ambition in life was to be esteemed by people that he esteemed. So would you join me in thanking Ralph Reed for his extraordinary leadership of this great coalition and this movement across America. Ralph and I have known each other a long time, all the way back when we both had dark hair. (laughs) But Ralph knows me well enough to know that um, I'm humbled by his words, but the introduction I prefer is a little bit shorter. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order, and it's my great honor to be with you tonight. And to be among so many people that make such a difference in pulpits around the land and in public service and leading organizations that represent our values. But I'm also honored to be joined tonight by some of my real heroes, like Senator James Lankford from the great state of Oklahoma, and to Eugene Scalia who is with us and the hundreds of Americans of faith who have come from near and far and all of those looking on. It's a joy to be with you tonight for this Patriots Gala. And I I also understand that later tonight, the Faith and Freedom Coalition is going to recognize another American who I have admired throughout my adult life. He's someone who has carried forth the conservative message as an educator, as a historian, as a voice on the public airwaves like very few Americans. He was Secretary of Education, and he's been educating Americans about the strength of our values and our foundation in liberty. Allow me to offer an early congratulations tonight to the recipient of this year's Winston Churchill Lifetime Achievement Award, Bill Bennett. It's an honor to be with you today. And speaking of friends of mine, let me uh, begin tonight by bringing greetings from another friend of mine. He's on the other side of the world, but I know his heart is here with all of you, and I know he kicked off your week of gathering for the Faith and Freedom Coalition. So allow me to bring greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. 70% of illegal immigrants, once they present at the border, report being victims of violence along the way. According to Doctors Without Borders, nearly one-third of young women traveling to our southern border from Central America are sexually assaulted on the journey. And this week, the heart of our nation broke when we saw the tragic 
photograph of Oscar Alberto Martinez and his 23-month-old daughter, Angie Valeria, drowned in the Rio Grande. It shocked the conscience of the nation. But the truth is what we saw then, on the front page of every newspaper in America, is what's been happening for months. People facing violence, sexual abuse, and worse being brought up by people who have no regard for human life, enticing them for their profit to make the dangerous journey north. I saw it firsthand when I was visiting the border. I went to the detention facility and to see these families, literally in numbers that have been overwhelming, our system was heartbreaking to me. To think of the way these poor and vulnerable families have been taken advantage of by these cartels and human traffickers was heartbreaking to see. But the American people are realizing we have a crisis on our southern border. That's why President Trump declared a national emergency in January. And I'm proud to report we've already started to build that wall. We'll have 400 miles of wall built by the end of next year. That's why President Trump took a strong stand and demanded that Mexico do more to secure our border and theirs. And thanks to the president's leadership, now Homeland Security projects that largely owing to Mexico's action, Illegal crossings at our southern border are already down by 25% in the last month alone. But men and women, we've still got more work to do. At a time when migrants south of our border are facing violence, sexual assault, and worse, it really is astonishing that many of the leading Democrats running for president continue to advocate open borders and policies that would make it easier for human traffickers to entice vulnerable families to take the long and dangerous journey north. It's true. For instance, despite the fact that 10 years ago, President Obama promised that Obamacare, in his words, would not apply to those who are here illegally, this week, every major Democrat candidate for president promised to offer free taxpayer-funded health care to illegal immigrants. And many even promised to decriminalize illegal immigration altogether. And maybe most remarkable of all, after, after spending the last six months denying there was a crisis at our southern border and doing nothing while our courageous and compassionate Customs and Border Protection personnel were overwhelmed by that crisis, now some Democrats want to lecture us about their moral concern for the people caught up in this crisis. Now let me be clear on this point. There's nothing compassionate about open borders. There's nothing compassionate about refusing to change the laws that human traffickers use to take advantage of poor families. Those who would advocate open borders, free health care for illegal immigrants, and making illegal immigration legal are making it easier for human traffickers to mistreat poor and vulnerable families. That is morally wrong, and that has got to stop. The moral thing to do, and I believe in my heart of hearts the compassionate thing to do, is to secure our border. Provide humanitarian support to families that are being exploited by these criminal syndicates. Reform our asylum laws and send a deafening message south of the border that if you want to come to the United States of America, you must come legally or not at all. Today, Democrats openly advocate an economic system that has impoverished millions around the world 
and rob the liberties of generations. That system is socialism. Earlier this week, we heard leading Democrat candidates for president defend socialism. But I think all of you know. It was freedom, not socialism, that gave us the strongest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. It was freedom, not socialism, that ended slavery, won two world wars, and stands today as a beacon of hope for all the world. And so as this debate begins in the next 18 months, we must resolve here to say, as the President said in his State of the Union address, America will never be a socialist country. Men and women, uh, the choice in this coming election has never been clearer. The stakes have never been higher. We've made great progress in the last two and a half years. But now's the time for us to redouble our efforts. Now's the time for us to come alongside the men and women who have been standing up for the values that we cherish, whether that be in state houses or in the Congress, or making sure that President Donald Trump gets four more years in the White House. America's got a choice to make. But when I'm gathered in front of all of you tonight and see this incredible group and think about the work that we've done together over the last several decades to renew and strengthen the foundations of this great nation, uh, when I see the way you've lifted up a generation of men and women from this president on down that have been standing strong and without apology on all those great and timeless American ideals, I'm confident. You know, I, I got to tell you, one of the most amusing words I ever hear, Ralph, are when people will stop me on a rope line at an airport or at a diner and they'll say, tell the president to keep going. I tell them there's something you never need to say. There is no rear view mirror for President Donald Trump. It's all out the windshield. It's all going forward. This president is going to keep fighting for the values and ideals that are making this country great. was going to happen. But we had a feeling, didn't we? And Ralph, I want to congratulate you and your wife, Joanne, and each and every person in the audience today. In just a few years, you've helped turn a small organization into a really nationwide, beautiful movement. And what you have achieved is extraordinary. I've spoken to this group so much, so often. I'll be back. Most recently, one year ago this week, when I came here to ask for your support, your help, and your prayers. And wow, did you deliver. <laughs> you really did. Last year, you knocked on more than 1.2 million doors in the key battleground states, where, as you remember, we focused. It's supposed to be focusing on those states. You sent 22 million pieces of mail shared 16 million videos, and made 10 million phone calls. That's something. 
And I'm honored by your incredible support and grateful for your commitment to our shared cause. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. You didn't let me down, and I will never, ever let you down. You know that. We will always support our evangelical community and defend your right and the right of all Americans to follow and to live by the teachings of their faith. And as you know, we're under siege. You understand that. But we will come out bigger and better and stronger than ever. You watch. You fought hard for me, and now I'm fighting hard for all of you. Today, because of technology, the internet, we have been able to build the most sophisticated and the most accurate Christian voter database that has existed in modern American political history. We see our job as a public service to the Christian community, to tell them what the media won't tell them, which is where the candidates stand on every issue that affects them and their families. Here are the candidates, here's where they stand on abortion, on life, on Obamacare, supporting Israel, on taxes, on really every key issue that affects them and their families. The reason why people should support and contribute to Faith and Freedom is really very simple. You have a effective and enduring voice at every level of government. We have needed that forever in America. Nobody does that better than Faith and Freedom, nobody does it more efficiently, and nobody does it with a higher return on their investment. I want to encourage you to be a member of the Inner Circle. The Inner Circle is our strongest and our best and our closest supporters. And without the Inner Circle, this work cannot go on. So please join it today and be on our team.